right, welcome back after the lunch break. Uh, we have a two-hour session now which has a geographical focus. It's a session on Greenland. It's a little bit longer because we had lots of activities uh, during the last summer in Greenland. And I will, when Martin is ready, hand over to Martin who is chairing the session. And also we will start with his rider expedition. Thank you, Nina. So I will talk about the rider expedition. I will give an introduction to the rider expedition and I also will actually give some results. Um, one of the reasons I will give results is that um, also from the oceanography part is because Johan Nilsson who was supposed to do that, he is in Boston. And then we had Christian Strande who was going to do the oceanography. He actually got a daughter two days ago. So, so it's, it's a good reason for that he's not here. And uh, Matt Reagan. I'm also going to present some of his results regarding the sediment uh, parts. But after that, we have a set, uh, set of speed talks that I will introduce as they come along. So the first part, and then we will move on to another part of Greenland. So the first part here on this Greenland session will, will be about this rider expedition. So you will hear about what rider is and everything. So this is a glacier that is far up on the northwestern Greenland. And no one had ever been in the marine part there before with any ship. So we thought this was quite special. So we actually reached out to Explorers Club and asked if we can do this like a flag expeditions, which they have. And they said yes. So we actually carried one of these flags as well, expedition number 51, which we thought was extra fun to do. So you can see all the, the groups involved here or all the different uh, universities and um, organizations. Primarily this was a Swedish U, uh, and US collaboration, but there were also Danish uh, participants and also from Canada. Here is the very long uh, list of scientific party. We were 40 scientists, so I'm not going to go through them all, but you will meet some of them here today. So this is the actual uh, whole group here on, on Icebreaker Oden in front of the Ryder Fjord, which is, or actually it's called Sheeran Ospon Fjord, which is the fjord we went into. So, <coughs> What is then Ryder Glacier? Ryder Glacier is located on the northwestern top of Greenland here. And uh, you can see that you have uh, brighter colors here. This is flow velocity of the Greenland ice sheet. And you can see that they flow out in ice streams here in, in several areas. And Ryder Glacier is the second largest of all the ice streams up here. The largest one is Peterman Glacier, which we had an expedition to in 2015. So we have sort of specialized now on the northwestern corner here. One of the reasons that we do this is, of course, the Swedish icebreaker Oden, because we are uniquely equipped to go there. I think there is almost no one else that can go there because of this icebreaker. So we are in a good position to do this. Here you see Ryder Glacier's ice tongue. It has a floating extension of the ice stream that goes into the ocean. So this is a floating part. These are really important, these ice tanks, because they also resist, the, provide what is called a buttressing force on the streaming ice of Greenland. There are not that many left. I will get to that in, in a short while. But that's another one of these main reasons why we went up here. This glacier was first described in 1917 of Lage Kock and Knut Rasmussen, who had the second Thule expedition up here. Then they were not in the marine part here. They were walking around on, on land here, actually. So uh, the main motivation of this, I would say this is a very cross-disciplinary expedition. There were 40 scientists from many, many different fields, and you would actually hear a selection here a little bit later here. I tried to come up with some key words here. Rapid changes, marine cryosphere, sea level rise, human colonization, ecologi ecological evolution. So it really spans very, very broadly. Here is the long list of, of scientific questions we have. And I will mainly speak about the dynamics of the green and ice sheet or actually the marine coupling up here, which is the, one of the bigger projects that knit together many of these smaller components. Up here on northwestern Greenland, we have, or entire northern Greenland, we have three floating ice tongues left. Uh, a few years ago, there were five. Now there are only three. And um, they have actually been losing quite a lot of mass. Ryder Glacier has been actually sustaining a little bit better than the other. That was one of the reasons we went up there. Why has this one not calved off as much as the other ones? But if, if you go back in only like a couple of decades ago, we had much more, several more 
ice, floating ice tanks up around Greenland here. We had down in Jakob Sound here, we had a very important one, which lost in the, in the end of the 90s. And that, after that happened, there is a complete change of the environment. You get much, a lot of icebergs just carving directly from the grounding line of the glacier. This is not happening here. We have the floating ice things, tongue still. So if I go into just trying to illustrate why we are so interested in this particular part of Greenland, another one is that we have what we call the marine coupling. That means that the Greenland ice sheet is pressed below sea level. You can see this is a map showing the bed elevation of Greenland. And everywhere you have blue, it's below sea level. And you can actually see three really interesting areas where you have a coupling to the interior of Greenland, which also pressed below sea level. And the northwestern part is one. So we call it these the, the three major marine couplings of the Greenland ice sheet. These are the areas which are so difficult to put a good prognosis of future sea level, sea level rise. These are the sensitive areas. This is where things can happen really fast. It's not just regular melting, it's the interaction with the ocean. So that is one of the major parts there. How does the ocean interact with these parts? Because warmer influx of water is, is the main, I would say, threat, but that's the main reason why this glacier can really all of a sudden start to lose mass very, very fast. So that was one of our motivation, come up there and actually do oceanographic measurements. Look how the seafloor looked like, because that's also very important. Because if there are thresholds in front of the uh, sills in front of the glaciers, which actually prevent the warmer water to come in, it can mean a great deal. And since we had absolutely no data whatsoever from these fjords up here, we had no idea if there even was a sill in front of the glacier or not, or if the water has sort of complete free flow in towards the glacier. So trying to constrain better models in the future for predicting sea level rise, that's another one of these big motivations. So we feed the results in for better numerical modeling. OK, so um, another thing I used to bring up is that you always see that the Greenland ice sheet is about 7.2, 7.4 meter. If you melt the whole Greenland ice sheet, that's not really plausible that that's going to happen in the foreseeable future. But a great deal can happen. And quite fast. So putting constraints on the timing and how much is another one of these motivations. In 2017, when they had the Thule expedition, Knut Rasmussen and uh, Lager Koch went up and they did heroic mapping around here. And they, you can actually see Ryder Glacier here. And you can see the ice tongue floating out here. This is extremely important information for us is these historical maps, because that means that we get a constraint on where the ice time was back in that time, and then trying to project that and compare that with the satellite records, which comes in from 1979 about. So uh, remember this, and I'm going to show it on another map here. I think we're going to hear something about, or I know we're going to hear something about the wolves later on in this expedition, because this is the, by far the most exciting expedition I, I've been to and the most difficult challenge to even get there. And one of the big things were wolves. And we're going to hear about that later. But when I started to read about the history here, it, it's, it's actually one of the few times I've read that one of these persons, there were two, two of seven members that got lost or died during this expedition. One they think were killed by wolves. And you will hear later on why these wolves, there seem to be a bit different different, these walls up here. So, um, OK, so here is a satellite image. Um, and this is from 2010. And now we're first, first look at Peterman Glacier, which is the biggest of them, which was the focus for our last expedition. Peterman has lost about 40% of his ice tongue since uh, 2010. There have been these major calving events. So they broke off huge chunks of this floating floating ice tongue. I, I swip, swap between tongue and shelf, but we call actually these ones ice tongues when they are constrained in fjords. But in, when you're in Antarctica, we normally say ice shelves. But so that it can be a little bit of confusion. But it's, it's literally the same thing, just a little bit of the surrounding that is different. So here in 2012, they, it broke up this very large uh, big flow. And I've started to use what I call Manhattan units. It's because I lectured a lot in, in the States, and they never know about 
Öland or Stockholm or anything, but everybody knows about the size of Manhattan. So to put it in perspective, we started with this Manhattan unit. So this is a Manhattan unit, and you can see that it's a quite large chunk that actually calved off there in Peterman in 2010. Another calving happened in uh, 2012, and then the ice uh, tongue got back here, uh, back to this red line here. And now it's about at this distance. It has expanded a little bit, but it's about back here. At the same time, Ryder has actually been quite stable. And if you go back the last 40 years, Ryder has been quite stable. If we go further back, Ryder has lost all of its part from here. This is the line which Lage Koch draw in from Ryder. It's pretty easy to put it into this map here. The fact is that these enormous icebergs, they're prob probably reminiscence from this last calving. We don't have satellite images, so we can't track them, but it must be so. So they're still entrapped in here. And that tells you something about the sea ice, which is the most difficult in the Arctic here in the Lincoln Sea. The ice, it takes a long time, or if it even gets out from here, from the calving events here. So these fjords can be very easily clogged. Okay, so that was one of the things. Why have these two behaved so differently? So we went up there. We had a full feathered program with marine geophysical mapping, uh, coring. Uh, we had... Uh, we even used plankton nets to take foraminiferous. Helen is here somewhere. Uh, we're actually working with those data. And we had, we had such a broad spectra of, of science here going on. We had land teams that were looking at uh, raised beach levels. So we, every day we flew with a helicopter with teams into land. We had lake drilling. I'll show you a little bit from that. So it was, and we even had an archaeology component for looking for human colonization up here. And they did find some really interesting finds. And I can, from a lot, my life of it, not understand how they could live up here. But it's a beautiful area, but it must have been quite harsh. So here you can see, in this area, everything we collected. Sediment cores, a lot of CTDs, which are the white dots here, the stars are the sediment cores. A lot of land camps of different source. Uh, Multi-beam mapping. When we came up here, we had no idea how the seafloor looked like, so we have to start to map our way in, which wasn't that easy, actually. This is from Peterman, where we did a similar campaign in 2015. And now we had also a chance to go back and do more oceanographic measurements so we could compare these two areas. So here is, again is Icebreaker Odin. Just to give you uh, some hint of how it looks like in the Lincoln Sea, which is the worst I've ever been to in, in the Arctic. It's, it's horrendously difficult sea ice. This more looked like, almost like a glacier because it could be five, five meter thick sea ice and almost impossible even for Odin to go through. So we have to break up and make a little hole where we can get the piston core down. But eventually, inside of these fjords, it's much easier to move around. Um, but when we came up there, we know that there was a big risk that we were not going to manage this expedition. So it was a little bit of psychology with everybody that took part of it and also with the captain. We had lots of discussion how we're going to do this, but everybody were, of course, very enthusiastic of getting in there, but you have to lower expectations. And when we came up to finally broke our way up to the fjord, we know these big icebergs existed in there, but we couldn't really envision it until you got there. So this is the first helicopter flight I made on the entrance to the fjord. This ice flow is about seven, eight kilometers long, and that was the entrance to the fjord. <laughs> and how you convince the captain to go there, that's... <laughs> That's not so easy. So we had a lot of discussion. How do we do this? And of course, he did not go in there. So, but the fact is that these icebergs, they are moving around. So we spend a lot of time of, of looking at satellite images that we got daily to track them. We put transponders on them. And we realized that they're moving around so much that the risk for us to be completely stuck is not that big. Even though sometimes we had to go through passages like this, and then you have a break off, and it looks like that. It's not, that's Odin for scale. So we had sort of these in between us and the entrance of the fjord. But Eric is the most fantastic captain you can work with, and he was actually persuasible. So just to give another scale of these fjords, because first of all, we had no data from there. And another thing a captain don't want to do is go in where there's not any measurements, so you don't know the seafloor. There could be heights in here that he can run aground on. Uh, so we couldn't just go in. 
we actually had to map our way in like that with Odin's multi-beam looking at the sides systematically. It took us 15 days in here to, to map out all the areas. That is Odin there, and that is Odin in Peterman Fjord. And then you sort of see the scales of these fjords. They're enormous. They're about 20 kilometers wide. So it takes a while to map them and to, to work with them. It's, it's really, really, really large settings. There is Ryder Glacier coming out with its ice tongue. And then we had this big calm piece here, the, the big iceberg here in front, which was moving around. So we wanted to map all the way up here, but that one was actually fixated here for a while. But then it moved out, so we could do it. We could get in there. Peterman Glacier, you have the uh, ice tongue out here. So just to show you a little bit how they moved around, there was a pattern to the, how they moved around, which is not completely resolved yet, why we had that particular pattern, but I think I need to do like this now. But there you can see, these are the big flows, how they actually move around in the fjord. So they're really, really, really moving around here. So essentially, during our time, one of these could go through half of the fjord, and some of these went almost through the entire fjord system. So it was for us a matter of finding our way here, doing mapping, doing coring, putting out our stations, and doing everything we needed to do to collect the data. So here is Ulf Hedman from the Polar Secretariat putting out one of these transponders that, that broadcast the GPS signals so we could, could put track on them. Because we couldn't fly every day with a helicopter because of the weather conditions, etc. This is uh, the ice tongue of Ryder Glacier. And here you actually see a one big new crack forming. So this will be a big calving event eventually here. This is not that far in. In Peterman, there is a very big crack that is so big that it actually already could be considered that you have a new calving event because it's detached completely from the ice, ice tongue. So Peterman will lose another big chunk. It, in glaciologically, you can ask Nina about that, but it has already lost it <laughs> because it's decoupled from the rest of the ice tongue. Okay, so that is sort of the, the main part of the expedition, how we got there, what we had to do logistically. And I will spend the last 15 minutes here or so, or 10 to 15 minutes, to show some of the results. We just came home. It's not that long ago. We came home in, in September. So the results are coming and coming, but there are quite a lot that came already during the expedition. So I will show a little bit of the geophysics, marine geology geophysics, which was the PIs are Matt Reagan and Brian Calder. I will show a little bit of the oceanography. The PIs are Johan Nilsson and Christian Stranne. I will show a little bit of the, uh, just showing because I think they're so beautiful, some records from Lake Service that we actually did with one of our sonars that we took in and I was rowing a little rubber boat <laughs> over the lakes. But it, the records are so nice, so they use them for pinpoint the coring targets. And, um, and then from there on we move on to, to hear other results. So the first question was here, what is happening in terms of warm water inflow towards ri Rider? There are no observations before, so we didn't really know. We know that Atlantic water comes in, or it actually goes all the way from the Fram Strait, recirculates in the, in the Arctic, and it finds its well over the shelf north of Greenland, come in the Lincoln Sea, and it goes in to come in here to Piedemann Glacier. That was known. We have about 0.3 up to 0.5 degree warm water that really goes in and affect and thin Piedemann Glacier. That we did know. But what happened in Ryder, we did not know. So number one was that we could establish that warmer water is also flowing in here in the same fashion as it does in the Peterman Glacier. You can see that I'm already here showing that we completely mapped Ryder, uh, and I will get into that in a while. But you can see two prominent features here. First, there is a seal here, there is a seal here, but there is also a seal here, which I get back to. So the, the interaction here between the bathymetry and the uh, warmer water inflow is very, very important. So that's another one of the results. So here is the, the detailed picture of that. So now we're looking at Ryder here, a cross section, or actually you see it from the profile from that angle, and you see Peterman in a, from this part here. So the ice tongue is here, and the ice tongue is here. This is Ryder, this is Peterman. And here you can see there is an outer seal. When I see, say seal, I mean a shallower part of the fjord bathymetry. The fjord itself is about eight, nine, 
900 meter deep and it's about 1100 meter deep and you can really see how the glacier in the past has excavated the fjord here and created this massive sill out in the front. This is material that the glacier push, pushed up. The outer sill in Ryder is equally large as this one, but it's a very be it's a bedrock feature and we don't find the sediments to the same way. So this is the first obstacle the warm water has to pass through. And then there are two passages here, one of 475 and one 375 meter. In Peterman, we have one of 443 is the deepest spot here. So warmer water is coming in over this sill. But then this was the, well, this was a new finding too, but this we absolutely did not expect. There is an inner sill in Ryder, a very big one, much shallower than this one, and really put the blockage to the water to the inside. So the first thing that we saw is that, yes, this probably make a whole lot of difference. And maybe this already is the ex explanation for the different behaviors once Ryder has got all the way back here. And putting together all the oceanogra oceanographic data, we see that it really has an effect. Here you can see the warmer Atlantic water coming in out over the outer sill. But when it comes to the inner sill here, which is shallower and provides a much bigger blockage, it doesn't really go back. There is a little bit of an entrance on the side here and it goes in and it interacts with the ice shelf and the grounding line, but we do not get the same water temperature as we have in, in Peterman. So we see that it doesn't have the same effect at all on melting of, of the rider at the present location. And we believe this is actually the main key point for this, why it has behaved so differently. So this is a, a paper that we have pre well, actually completely com completed. Uh, we left behind some temperature buoys. These are buoys uh, made by the KTH and it's Nina's project really. They call the Lutus bu buoys and uh, Nina's students, Abhay and Felicity sitting somewhere here probably. They named them to Martin and Nina because we paid for one each. <laughs> and that means that they're, they're very cynically were going to drown us and kill us. <laughs> so you can see the crosses here, we are left behind. But I do think in one year, Nina and I are gonna resurrect and then provide temperature data here. So we, they're strategically put it on the top of the seal here and then in the entrance where the water, warmer water comes in here on the side as well. So that will be very exciting if we get those records in a year from now. Um, another thing that was very surprising, very, very surprising, we have not resolved why, but it was immensely warm in the upper water in, in, in the Sherrod Osborne Fjord at Ryder. These are surface temperature measurements down to a depth of about six, eight meters. We had actually up to six, seven degree warm water. This we could never even imagine. We thought there were all sorts of measurement problems, but this is actually measurements from the ship all the time. The white you can see are up in about half a degree and then the red or even less colder and the red here are even more than three and a half degree and you can see how this sticks out. We have not really figured out, you one and Christian are working on it. They think maybe this has to do with that it was a very warm summer but also that there is very little wind in there so we had no mixing really and, and maybe that is one of the reasons but it's not resolved. But it turned out that we tried to look at some longer term satellite data and, and there is an anomaly in this fjord over the last years. But this is immensely, it's a huge difference. It's hard to grasp how, diff how big difference it is. Um, the other thing when it comes to the sediment cores, we know we have fantastic records. We, we want to go back and reconstruct the ice tongue and the ice uh, stream behavior over since the Holocene, because that's is when the ice retreated back in here. You can see how much sediment these, uh, even the ice shellfish or ice tongues are providing. This is the chocolate, very, very, very fine sediments. And we took transects of sediment cores, and Matt has already started to look at this, and he can see some very distinct packages here where you have more ice rafting, which most likely is when the ice tongue has been away, so you call directly from the grounding line. We have no dates of this yet, so we don't know when this is happening, if it is in the early Holocene, etc. In Pietman, we actually had a period in the early Holocene when the ice tongue was completely gone, and then it grew back again in somewhere around two, 3,000 years ago to become a, a permanent feature that goes back and forth. So this is ongoing work. 
I just wanted to show this. This is uh, this, this. This may look ridiculous, me rowing <laughs> with this device, but it created fantastic records, so they could actually do uh, lake coring and pinpoint the best locations for it. We had uh, a radio-controlled little multi-beam mapping device that we could control over the lake and do multi-beam mapping. The idea was to send this before Odin, actually, when we came into unmapped areas, but it turned out it was a little bit too little for that target, actually. It felt like putting in something into a horrible scenario. We would have lost it, really. So it, it ended up that we did this along, work with this one along the shores, and also in the lakes, and there it was fantastic. So the lake team took some really nice sediment cores, which are they're going to look also look at uh, ancient DNA in, but also reconstruct climate from very different aspects. And this was one of my highlights. Uh, working with our small boat, we can come up to uh, very close to the outlet glaciers. This is uh, one of the outlet glaciers in Peterman Fjord. This is absolutely so fun. It's almost as fun as surfing to do, go out and do this. So you really come up and do, we did a mapping in front here. We found lots of new discoveries. But one thing i never seen before was narwhals. We had uh, uh, an event, which obviously is very, very rare. So they, they want us to do something about this. But there was a massive, uh, large group of narwhals coming into Peterman Fjord. And we stood here in front and were mapping. And then all of a sudden, someone says, are the seals there? No, they're not seals. They look kind of big for that. And then they're, they're narwhals. And they, they were so occupied with what they were doing. So they came in a big, like almost like an army <laughs> towards us. They almost ran into the boat. So this one is like one and a half meter from the boat. And then they didn't really care about us. They just moved on and did their business there. So they are right in front of the outlet glaciers, probably because of nutrients and, and all the activity there and whatever they are feeding from the bottom, etc. Okay, so that was uh, my part of the introduction, half an hour, and then we're going into going to the rest of the talk. So thank you. <laughs> and th there is there is time for questions. Yeah, okay. There is time for questions. <laughs> Well, no questions. OK, then I think we move on. And um, the first speaker here is going to be Folke Brüchert, who's going to talk about water and sediment chemistry study during the Ryder expedition. Okay. Folke, you need this one, I think. Yeah, so uh, we were a, a team actually of, um, and I have, I have now listed a lot of people that were involved in, in the water and sediment chemistry studies that we conducted on RIDA. And this was, this was work, of course, that relied on, uh, on, the, on the logistical support of, of a large part of the scientific crew that was working on the vessel. And then so I've, I've included those that were closest to the work, but of course also a lot of other people that are under the shipboard scientific party that, that were also participating in this work. Um, a, few, a few little pictures that you see at the top. Um, we were, we were, the work that I'm going to do uh, to talk about now is mostly that work that was done by three types of uh, um, sample collection devices. The one was, was um, surface sediment coring that we did with the multicora. We did, of course, because of the water sampling, a lot of CTD rosette sampling, but we also had placed on Odin um, a seawater intake system that was continuously pumping surface water into the vessel and we connected instruments to that seawater intake and uh, with that water we could take continuous measurements of pH, of the partial pressure of CO2 in the surface water and we could measure alkalinity. And that gave us then a continuous record of these parameters as the ship was moving throughout the expedition and that's of course a very, very large data set. 
Now, a little bit about the motivation that at least when I received an, uh, an email from Martin inviting who would be interested in participating in the expedition, and it just came about a year ago, and, uh, and I was like, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's an opportunity. So I had been working previously quite a lot on Svalbard and the Svalbard fjords, and uh, I hadn't been working on Greenland. And so um, the idea I had was knowing about the, the melting processes in front of glaciers, how could that be connected to biogeochemical processes? And as Martin had already said before, we could distinguish principally two types of glaciers, those that still have a very well-developed ice tongue and those that are grounded and are calving directly. And so with these very two distinct types of glaciers, we actually have very different um, freshwater, seawater interactions in these fjord systems. And what, we're, or what I'm particularly interested in is with the melting of these glaciers and the release of waters from land, from Greenland, underneath the ice sheets into the ocean, what is the impact of that delivery to the ocean coastal ecosystem? How are nutrients delivered? At what concentrations does this happen? And how does this reflect into the future the ecosystem state of an, an Arctic margin system? So this was one of the questions I had that I wanted to address. What are those nutrients levels? What sediments are deposited there? And how do they recycle, actually, nutrients to the seawater? Adam Ulfsbo from the University of Göteborg, who was responsible for the continuous CO2 measurements, he was interested in how does this glacial meltwater actually affect the carbonate system? What are the CO2 levels? What is the pH, and how does that affect actually processes such as ocean acidification? So these were two um, distinct targets that sort of in the course of that expedition merged into one big program. And so together with, of course, Christian and Johan, um, we started to initiate a very, very large sampling program. There were over 50 CTD stations that we took water samples of, and Jonas Fredriksson was working bone hard the whole expedition to collect hundreds up to thousands of samples now that are going to be worked up. Not many have been worked up so far. Some we could already do, but uh, the data set that we still have here, that will take a while until we worked it up. At a selected of these stations, we went into the more tedious sediment sampling where we collected multicores, started to do pore water chemistry. And so I have just shown a little list that gives you an, an impression of what we're trying to do. We have these continuous pH, CO2, alkalinity, methane measurements from the seawater intake. We have the CTD bottle program by which we do everything in profile. Then we have the sediment biogeochemistry program where we're particularly focusing on the carbon mineralization rates. We want to measure the benthic flux exchanges of CO2 and nutrients between the sediment and the bottom waters and how it is entrained again into the seawater. And we want to, of course, do pore water chemical analysis. I'm just sort of give you a little panopticum of what it looked like on board. And uh, you get to see also what the material looked like that were actually brought up to the surface. And, it was dirty work because these sediments turned out to be soupy. I mean, soupy is a good description of them. They were hardly sediments. I have never seen sediments of that sort actually before. They were reddish brown, extremely red, and they were 90% water. We had a video system on the multicora, so we could actually take videos as the multicora descended through the water column to the bottom, and it was like a snowstorm a dirty snowstorm in these fjord system, extremely dense suspended sediment that then settled on the seafloor. But by far not dead, brittle stars and other macrofauna is present in these systems. And what we then set out to do was experiments in the containers. We, there you can see Adam, for example, sampling from the CTD rosette, or Jonas collecting also water samples and rhizome poor water measurements. I just show you some of the contrast that we observed. And what you see here is a, a microelectrode setup system by which we're doing high profile, high resolution profiling of oxygen concentrations in the surface. These are 100 micrometer resolution oxygen measurements through the sediment water interface. And you can see that the three right profiles are actually from the right of fjord, different distances from the glacial tongue, 
And what you can see are extremely steep oxygen concentrations. That within a centimeter in these 1,000 meter or 800 meter deep sediments, you're consuming all the oxygen. These sediments are red, 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 red. You just think there should be so much oxygen in the system. These systems are anoxic within a centimeter down. And that reflects a lot of oxygen consumption. That reflects a lot of carbon is cycled through the system because it's respiration that you're looking at. When you go out into the sea ice covered region of the Lincoln Sea, you couldn't see a bigger contrast. You never run out of oxygen. This is an extremely carbon starved system under the sea ice. Oxygen gradients are very, very low, and these are factor six to factor eight differences in oxygen consumption. So these fjord systems are very, very active. They are already productive, they're turning over a lot of material. Um, we did more of this. We did whole core incubations. And Adam, of course, contributed with his data on the alkalinity concentrations. And what we see that we had much, much lower alkalinities in the fjord systems compared to the Lincoln Sea and the Narrow Strait, but also lower alkalinities compared to Peterman Glacier. Well, that, again, was corresponded to the finding that we found that these the CO2 concentrations in the Ryder Fjord were grossly undersaturated. These fjord waters are a very, very strong CO2 sink, which makes the water, of course, acidic and has a much, much lower pH. So it all kind of makes sense. These are very productive fjord systems. They take up a lot of CO2. It gets deposited. It gets recycled. Oxygen gets consumed. So the system in itself is much, much more productive than somebody would actually expect. So just to summarize is what we know so far. I've just done a little list of that, and li that list is certainly going to grow over the next months and the next year. I think this is very, very exciting. It's an opportunity that just came along without me knowing it would come along, actually. <laughs> and uh, so with that, um, I want to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Volker. Do we have any questions for Volker? Yep. You said that these are very productive. Is, is it basically diatom production that happens there? Yeah, we have actually not done that. But yes, I would expect a lot of diatom production in these systems. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. We didn't find as many foraminifers in here no. as we no. do in the mm -hmm. outer part. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're, as you say, the different type of production, more silica production. And yes, yes. Mm -hmm. No more questions? OK, then we move on to the next speaker, which I believe is, now I see it is Felicity, <laughs> who's going to speak about uh, the Calding glaciers. I worked a lot on the boat with Abhi Prakash, and then on land with Nina, some people from KTH, and also had a lot of help from uh, Martin during and since the expedition. So I think this graph we've already seen before, but I was just putting it up there to uh, talk about ice-ocean interactions, which is basically the motivation um, for the work that we did at Ryder, and uh, like my general research topic. So there's quite a lot of uncertainty over future sea level rise projections. And one of those uncertainties is within the carving process. In a lot of uh, numerical models, it's a uh, parameterization rather than kind of physically based. And part of the reason for this is that there's a lot of satellite data that we have. And this makes massive headlines, like you can see in the one from BBC. But in terms of the actual individual events, there isn't that much data. Because when you're looking at satellites, you can't actually see how the carving is happening. And so we wanted to get really high resolution data sets of um, the carving at Ryder to see yeah, if we can uh, hopefully find something out about how, how the carving occurs. So we deployed a time lapse uh, camera, which took photos every five seconds at Ryder Glacier for about 11 days, and then for a short period of time at Peterman Glacier. 
and so ended up with a lot of images. Um, there were some days where there was a lot of fog, so though it's like an 11 day time series, it's only about nine days of actual data, but it's 24 hours because it was light uh, pretty much all the time. So there was a lot of data to go on and also some nice helicopter rides to set up. Um, this has also been talked about, but I was going to point out on the satellite image, the green dot is where the camera was. Um, and the scale here is quite large. So we get a ride is about nine or 10 kilometers across. So it's quite, we can see the whole um, glacier front from the camera, but it is obviously harder to see events far away. And then we have the two uh, Lotus boys that are measuring temperature, um, which you can see there, they're quite close to the glacier. And yet we should come up uh, next August and hopefully have um, a lot of data on the temperatures. There's also a lot of data which um, Odin measures itself, or the meteorological variables, and was quite interested in looking at this to see if it related to the calving events. So these are all the wind roses, basically for the period where we had the camera at Ryder Glacier, and then for the whole period down in the bottom. And what I kind of wanted to show with this was that there were, on the whole, kind of two different kind of modes, I guess, more northerly winds and more southerly winds, and then we had the southerly winds, the wind speeds were um, higher. And you can see on here the wind speeds to the right and air temperature to the left during the same period. And then the, the period with the, the grey box, about, I think, three days or something uh, near the end, was when we had these southerly winds with the higher wind speeds, the higher temperatures. And also from all the calving events that we found in the images, 75% of them occurred during that period. So there seems to be some kind of temporal clustering there and potentially a link between um, the metrological variables and the calving. So these are all the carving events that we found at Ryder. Um, the colors are talk about the carving styles, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. But basically there's a lot of red, which will be the main uh, carving style that I talk about. Uh, but yeah, this is how it looked. Um, it looks like we have a very good coverage of the glacier front, and we did. But when you convert the kind of pixel coordinates from the oblique imagery, to the actual real world coordinates using satellite images and uh, digital elevation models. You can see that there is one section in particular where we don't really have much data, um, which makes sense considering that the camera couldn't actually see that part of the glacier so well. But otherwise, the calving events seem to be quite well distributed across uh, the whole front of Ryder Glacier. So onto calving styles. Um, so looking at the actual events themselves, the, most of the events, 52%, showed this kind of sheet collapse style. And I've used the same descriptions as been used in previous papers. And this sheet collapse is basically where you just get this whole kind of well, sheet of ice just falling straight down. So it's not toppling forward, it's just kind of falling straight into the water. And there can be reasonably large events, so not large on the scale of these massive icebergs, but as you can see from the, the sizes of this one, it is of a reasonable size. And most of the events we found at Ryder were this. It could also be that the splashes are quite big from these events, so maybe they're just easier to see. But we definitely found a higher proportion than has been found um, by some other studies where they're looking more at grounded glaciers. But, um, so that was quite interesting to, to see. And then these are some of the other types of carving that we found. You may notice it adds up to more than 100% with the sheet collapse. And that's because a lot of events you kind of started with like a smaller waterline event, and then you had this whole sheet collapse happening afterwards. And I've classed that as one event, and I guess it's, you could argue maybe that's two events, but when it's exactly the same place, I've kind of said it's waterline and sheet collapse or something like this. Um, and it happened quite a lot that you'd get these kind of smaller bits of carving followed by a much kind of larger event at the same location, which suggests, you know, and it's been found before that this, each carving will alter the stress balance a little bit at the terminus and lead to further events at the same time. And hopefully, you'll see this in the video, which should play there. So this is 16 frames a second, and it's, so you couldn't see so clearly the different events. But essentially, it kind of goes around this kind of triangle uh, every kind of five, 10 seconds, and then onto kind of like the next bit along. So it's basically five or six kind of separate carving events all happening five, 10 seconds after each other. Um, and again, this is probably about the front of this is about 150 meters long. So these are a reasonable large amount of ice that is um, coming off. And then also with the images, you can track the displacement of features on the surface. So this is just showing pixel displacements. 
the arrows showing the magnitude. This isn't the actual distance it moved, it's just a relative magnitude between um, the different points that I'm showing on this image. And at the moment, these are just pixel displacements, but the, the next step would be to use an elevation model to convert this to real world coordinates and then get this nice fine scale um, velocity fields. There are errors associated with it because of the oblique um, angle, but hopefully it will give some nice results. And then combined to that, using some satellite data to extend the record back and look at a larger scale. So this is Peterman on the left and Ryder on the right um, from August, so when we were in the fjords. Um, and I'm hoping to get velocity fields back to 2006 to look for any kind of general trends, like look more clearly at how they differed from each other. Yeah, and just see if there's, um, if they're progressing in different ways, if there's any kind of indication of um, anything happening, I guess. And then related to that, when you do get these large break-offs that was talked about earlier, and you've got evidence that one might happen soon at Peterman and maybe at Ryder, it'd be, um, there's been some data from Peterman that, for instance, at the 2010 event, there was, I think, no speed up of the glacier after the big event, but in 2012 there was. And so it would also be really interesting to see, is there a trend in like, the dynamic response of these glaciers to these big events? Is, is that changing? And how does that um, compare between the two glaciers? At like hopefully the well not hopefully the next big events but when they happen see uh, if there's anything um, to be found. So thank you. That was everything. Thank you for visiting. Do you have questions? Yep, for Danny then Ray. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for a very nice presentation. I was just curious, how do you work with the, with the data? Do you actually sit and watch the footage and try to find the calving events? Or like, how do you, do you have nine days of just... The, the original <laughs> plan was uh, to use, there's been some code written for automatic detection. Mm -hmm. And so I started using this, but I was testing it against kind of finding a calving event. And it wasn't working so well, I think because of the scale of Ryder Glacier and it was developed for a much smaller glacier on Svalbard. So in the end, um, because I was worried about missing the data, it converted, with the help of uh, Bjorn Eriksson, all of the photos into time-lapse videos, which are a lot mm. quicker to look through than if you look through a couple of times, because the splashes are really clear on the videos. Okay. And because it's uh, an ice tongue rather than a grounded glacier, there aren't so many events that you can, it is possible to do it. But it would be nice to get it running automatically, mm. so you could do longer time series. Okay. Thank you. So there, there are various attempts to parameterize ca calving rates uh, out there in the literature. Richard Alley has, has one of them, and they're not all exactly uh, aimed at this particular kind of situation, but I was just wondering to what extent um, uh, 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 there are plans to use this kind of data to uh, actually see how well the various pra calving parameterizations actually do. Yeah, I think that would be like, definitely an ultimate aim is to try and that use this data and hope it'd be really nice to run like a model of Ryder Glacier and see do we see the same type of calving events, the same frequencies. So that would definitely be something that I'd like to do and see if some work better than others and also compare it to different glaciers like grounded tidewater glaciers and see if there is a way to, to find what works best. But not yet, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Well, then we move on to Bjorn Gunnarsson, who's going to talk about, uh, well, I know what you're going to talk about. It will be about wood. And, bef <laughs> and before, I should say that they are the ones who got most nicknames on board. They were the carpenters, they were the dead wood, they were the woodpeckers, they were everything associated with wood. And every day we sent them out to different areas. And they came back and said, we found more wood than ever. <laughs> so I think it just continues in a continuous stream. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Nicknames uh, during the expedition. So we um, uh, actually is um, missing one name here. It's Hans Lindholm. I updated the, the version during lunch here. So uh, uh, and uh, my colleague is from uh, Gothenburg University. Sorry about that. So what is uh, Arctic driftwood or driftwood? Well, it's trees that are um, growing uh, close by and uh, around the, the, the continental regions, uh, usually 
close to riverbeds, but also comes from logging in this area, especially from Russia, have we noticed. There's a lot of cut logs from this area, and about 30% uh, of all the loggings from, from Russia is actually uh, ending up as driftwood in the, in the Arctic uh, uh, basin. Um, so, and of course, all this driftwood will sink into the, uh, to the bottom of the sea if it's not uh, incorporated into sea ice. So it's frozen into sea ice and transported um, uh, along the ocean currents uh, and ending up at uh, deposited at, at um, kind of um, shallow uh, and ice-free coastline. And it's quite important that it needs to be ice-free. Otherwise, there would no, not be possible for the logs to float into the shore. Um, and driftwood have been, is known to be in, in this area. So there's been quite a lot of studies from, from uh, all the uh, Arctic uh, basin here. And here's the, uh, some of the kind of findings that we ha uh, have. We have worked in, in Svalbard or Spitsbergen, uh, and that's kind of very important uh, resource, actually, for people living here. Uh, and I have a piece here um, that I hope uh, someone can tell me what it is, actually. Uh, it's kind of not what we call uh, really driftwood, but it is a piece of something that has been used uh, for of, of people doing something. I don't know what it is. Uh, so, and we have a lot of uh, uh, different dates from this uh, uh, driftwood, and it comes from the recent part and uh, as old as 12,000 years old. And, and one important thing is here that we can't really say where it is from. Uh, no, it has not been uh, any uh, studies about the wood anatomy that could actually. Uh, tells you something about the region of uh, the wood itself. But we have a method of that doing that. So um, a little bit what we could use this Arctic driftwood for. And that is to, uh, of course, uh, reconstruct the Arctic uh, ice variability. If we have a lot of uh, ice filling the, the Arctic basin here, then there will be certain periods that uh, will no finding of driftwood because the ice is blocking the, the shoreline, the shallow shorelines. It tells us also something about uh, the, the changes in the, the current uh, 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 Arctic Ocean currents in, in this area. And also, in turn, uh, tells us something about the atmospheric circulation. Also, uh, it could also provide you with some information about past climate variability. Since, you, uh, since all these logs could be uh, placed uh, on a kind of geographical scale uh, and known with a known uh, geographical region. So that, that could uh, kind of extend the existing networks of different chronologies, dendrochronologies uh, in this area and help us uh, extend the chronologies from this area. And, uh, and of course, that is used for uh, kind of... Uh, 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 northern hemisphere uh, climate reconstruction uh, later on. So, and, and another thing, it also could say something about the isostatic uplift. Because if you find a log, for example, like 50 meters above the present uh, shoreline, it tells you about the, uh, and you can actually date that very precise within a year, then you can have the kind of uh, the age of how fast the land was uh, moving upwards. 
And uh, as Martin said, we were really, really lucky. Uh, uh, much uh, of help of the helicopter, of course. I don't want to talk about the carbon footprint of uh, our study here. But, uh, including Oden, of course, but also the, the, the helicopters. We had something called the, the helicopter uh, uh, cutting, sort of landing with uh, different logs because uh, these logs are not found in kind of uh, piles exactly. It could be like 500 meters or even one and a half kilometers uh, uh, beside them. So it's a lot of wa walking. But we were able to find over 200 samples from this area where you have previously found around 60. Uh, and that's, th this 60 is from spanning from 1960 to uh, until we got there. So we were really uh, lucky with that. And some uh, preliminary results shows that most of these uh, findings that the wood that we have comes from Russia. And that because we could know that already uh, from a, a kind of wood anatomy that you could tell about the, the, the subspecies of different uh, larch, for example, or pine or uh, spruce. But also, um, we could use what we call dendro provenance. Uh, not just by, you can actually date a log very exactly within a year, the outermost ring could tell you exact year of death of that uh, log. But you can also use the network because we have around uh, the Northern Hemisphere lots and lots of uh, chronologies that we could take an unknown sample that we have, measure the, the ring with uh, in this case, and try to uh, match that with the different chronologies around uh, this region. And then we could very exact say, okay, this log come from, for example, Yakutsk here which is one of the youngest that we have so far, 1995. And that means that it took 22 years uh, coming from that region, going for, uh, out in the river, incorporated into the ice and float around a little bit and then uh, ending up at the shore in Greenland. That's quite amazing, I think. So with that, I will end with a uh, wolf picture, uh, as you promised. Thank you. Do we have a question for Bjorn? Yep. So it looked like in uh, one of those pictures there that you showed the log is actually slightly up from the shoreline. So do you get that from, you know, if you have very old logs and you had variations in sea level, there are some of them Yeah, the, it, the it, it, Yeah, it could be that. Uh, but I think that you have a, a part of that is a, is a static uplift. One of the logs we find at 30 meters, I think, above the present. But it can also be from storms. Uh, or that the ice is pushing up the, uh, the logs. No more questions? Okay, then I think this picture is a very good introduction for the next speaker, which is Johannes Måsviken, who is going to talk about terrestrial ecology in the high Arctic environment. There. Sorry. So I felt obliged to have the expedition shirt. Nobody else had it, apparently, but uh, <laughs> I did. So I'm going to tell you some uh, observations I did during the expedition and what I did. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that much data yet, so I'll just most show pretty pictures. 
uh, start with some brief background. Arctic environments are characterized by harsh climate and uh, low primary productivity. And there is a known relationship with decreasing species richness with increasing latitude, but also with altitude. And as we all know, climate change is altering the global temperatures. But due to polar amplification, we have an uh, almost double temperature increase at high latitudes. And this causes a lot of changes in species distribution and range shifts. And we're interested in how this reduction in habitat area and increased fragmentation will affect the communities, the high Arctic communities. And what ecological interactions will get affected by this. So as Martin mentioned before, this northwestern Greenland consists of different peninsulas. They're separated by these huge fjords and also the Greenlandic ice sheet separates these, so they are quite isolated areas. And we expect that species, most of the species has dispersed from the Canadian archipelago up into this area and that the communities in the, on these peninsulas consist of subsets of the regional species pool. So we did this by flying out with the helicopters and setting up field camps and tenting, but also did day trips. More specifically, we flew out to these two peninsulas. We also did day trips to the other peninsulas. The Ryder Glacier is here for reference, and the Peterman Glacier is here. And I'll just present some brief methods and observations. We use a scalable stratified random sampling design using a one kilometer transect. And along this transect, we have five sampling stations. And each sampling station consists of five square meter plots for vegetation mapping. Within these plots, we have a 10 centimeter grid. We also note uh, the relative abundance using intercept sticks like this. And we note the vegetation coverage and the moss and lichen covered, and also the cover of uh, dead plant tissue. And the floor in this area is mostly composed of Arctic and Alpine plants, but also a lot of high Arctic specialists that only occurs in the high Arctic, and also great influence, for instance, this center species of the North American flora, since it's so close to Ellesmere Island and the Canadian archipelago. The most important species, however, for the terrestrial ecosystem is the Arctic willow. This is the foundation for all the grazing species, such as musk ox and Arctic hare. And also the abundance of Arctic willow uh, provides a basis for the, the, the grazers and also for the carnivores. And the vegetation in the landscape is quite heterogeneous. This is mostly Arctic desert. And you find the most vegetation where you find moisture in the landscape. So these small streams and also the small depressions where snow can accumulate during the winters. And that's also what our data shows, that you have quite a big difference between different transects and between different peninsulas. And we also collected data, or my supervisor did, during the Peterman expedition. So we'll try connecting these data sets together and try to get more comprehensive look at the terrestrial ecology in the area. In addition to the vegetation, we also sampled arthropods using normal pitfall traps. They're just a small jar. There's, uh, we dig the jars close to the uh, plant plots. So we can connect, hopefully, the vegetation cover with the uh, insects in there or the art arthropods. We also use molasses traps that is for flying insects. And we also collect a lot of pellets and scats and remnants of animals to look at food webs and interactions. We also did just visual observations of all vertebrates we could see, for instance, Arctic hare. And of course, a lot of muskox on some of the peninsulas. Now I hopefully will want some sound. Oh. 
So, as Martin said, this is one of the few areas where we don't really have any human settlements. And this is a great opportunity to find animals in their sort of undisturbed state if exempt climate change. So we had the great fortune of meeting some uh, Arctic wolves close up. And this is filmed with my iPhone, so it's less than 20 meters away. <laughs> and they were up close, like 10 meters. So this, this pack had probably never seen humans before. And they were very curious. And I want to thank everybody on the cruise, especially the, the land team who stayed out in the field. And a special thanks to my founders and Lou and Frederick, my supervisors, both joining on the expedition. And, uh, my last super car in. That's all for me. Questions? If not, I can have a I have a question, immediate question, because I know the big snackies, as we say in Sweden, were the wolves. Every time we flew out and do something, you had new encounters with the wolves. How many times did you actually see them? Uh, I only saw them twice, but the group in total saw them more times. So we did. We had to go to that area where the pack were. They had, um, they, they had a dead muskox there, so they didn't really want to move from that. So, so you, you actually landed where the muskox were? Yeah, yes. so the first time we flew out, we, we landed, and they just came up to helicopters, which is unheard of. Normally, wolves are terrified of helicopters, but these weren't, so <laughs> that's a bit special. Any more yeah. questions? Did you set any pollen traps or take any modern pollen surface samples? By any no, chance? however, we take soil samples. When we dig the small hole for the pitfall trap, we take uh, soil samples. Because, I mean, that could be really interesting to compare perhaps with paleoclimate records if you're yeah. going to analyze. And the second uh, land team, uh, which uh, Martin told you about, they did the lake coring for DNA, but they also can look at pollen there. So. No, because you want a nice comparison between the modern ones and what you're finding in the cores. Yeah. So exactly. that would be nice. More questions?